Welcome back to another episode of the Plastic Weekly Debrief. There has been a lot of Olympic qualification action in the climbing world lately, particularly with the Pan American Championships taking place in Chile, and then the European qualification taking place, and some European qualification speed that took place before all of that, and world championships that took place before all of that. If you're tuning into this show, it probably means you tuned into some of that, if not most, if not all of it. So we are happy you're here, and we're going to dive into everything. My name is John Bergman. I'm slipping into the host chair, or at least, I guess, the intro chair for this. Uh, normally, the host would be the man that's way over on the end, Tyler Norton. And he's here, and we're excited about that. And also here is Albert Oak, who, uh, gosh, I don't even know how to best describe Mr. Oak, uh, a YouTube star, uh, renowned coach, speed coach, speed expert, um, uh, elite competitor. There's a lot of different ways I could describe it, but we're stoked that Albert's taken some time to chat with us here. Albert, let's just start off. I listed all of those things that you're, you've been up to over the past few months. How you doing and, and what, what's kind of on your plate right now? Well, I've been getting over wiping all the tears that I've stored for about like 20 plus years of my life because after Piper and Sam qualified for the Olympics, the floodgates were open. Um, my life is slightly changed now, but I'm still climbing. I'm still coaching. I have other hopefully Olympians on the way, and now I'm here with you two, so I'm excited. Straight up, are you like the are you the the unofficial like Team USA speed coach? What is your status? Because all of them are shouting you out. I don't know if Team USA has an official speed coach. Are are you just that guy? What's like what is the deal here? So we have an officially hired strength and conditioning coach that was labeled as a speed coach. So it was yeah. really confusing initially um, when he was brought on. But before him, I kind of just absorbed all the athletes that ended up going and performing that are that are doing so well. And so I'm definitely unofficially, officially the U.S. speed coach, but it's a very unofficial title. It's like definitely athlete given. Um, I mean, I don't have credentials or anything, so. Sure, but you, you, you do have the credentials of people who just got invites to the Olympics are like, thank you for everything. You've been so helpful, like shouting you out in stories, like all this kind of shit. Like, so that's pretty legit as a credential. Like you're obviously an important part of their development. Um, I don't like, I don't, I'm not going to ask people about money and stuff. I know you've been like super generous with your time. You always talk about on shows, like, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get into speed and you want some like help and coaching, just give me a shout and you never really talk about money. I I'm not going to say anything. It's up to you if you want to say anything, but I hope you're getting paid by somebody because if you're not the USA coach, I hope the kids or their parents or whoever are chipping in like a fiver or something here and there. Um, like I know, I, I think all three of us understand that being an Olympian does not equate to having money for training, especially in the USA, but I hope you're getting some some uh, 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 some reward for the amount of time you're putting into, or at least for the tears. I hope you're getting paid for the tears, Albert. That's all. <laughs> that's all I hope for. Let's just say I have uh, bread to eat, so that's like all I need, I guess. <laughs> Keeping the meme alive, the whole the whole Albert Oak <laughs> meme. Sure, yeah, all right. Tyler, let's switch it over to you. What have you been up to lately? Because you certainly, judging by your Instagram posts, have been doing some pretty cool stuff with some pretty cool people. So uh, fill I've, us in. I, I, I just do book review interviews now. I've given up on all the Plastic Weekly interviews now. I only interview you about your books. Yeah, uh, Sasha DeJulian came <laughs> by Joe Rockheads on, on the book tour. Like, I mean, it's a it's a book interview. So it's pretty like a, it's a softball interview, man. It's not the interview I would know. Not that I have like a bunch of criticisms of Sasha DeJulian. I would just spend like two hours asking her about the 2011 season and about the people she competed against. Whereas her book is covers obviously not just her competitive career, but also her outdoor career and her entrepreneurship and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was great having her. She's, she speaks really well. The book was actually surprisingly nice to read. Um, if you're interested in the history of her as a climber or also many of the climbers that were like in her sphere, it was pretty illuminating. So I, I would actually recommend it if you're just a fan of climbers. As much as I was afraid it would be a bit of um, 
like, I think I thought the book was going to be kind of an inspirational tome. Uh, it was actually a very good climbing read. If you like climbing, it's a good book for you. So uh, I'm, you know, I'm not being paid anything to say that, but I paid for it and I don't regret it. So uh, thumbs up for Sasha's Take the Lead, one of the better uh, climbing memoirs so far. Nice. Uh, well, let's get into this because I know we have a lot to talk about in a limited amount of time. And I, I think, let's just start here. Albert, I want to ask you, I'm, I'm sure you, you have a lot of speed in, insights that you can impart and we want to hear all of them. But first, before we get into the kind of the nuance of the speed, just when you think about both disciplines that have taken place, the combined and speed, and you think about worlds and you think about the European stuff and you think about the Pan Am stuff at the bird's eye level, the 30,000 foot view of everything that's happened so far, have the Olympic qualifications been defined in your opinion, more by surprises and the surprise Olympic births that we have seen so far, or has it been kind of who we would have expected to qualify qualifying? What What's the, as we predicted or or just a, a lot of shock and awe i guess a little bit of both but mostly as of predicted the order it happened was probably shocking like nobody expects like who can expect anyone to beat mirasol right and of course emma uh, won that and then you'd eventually expect emma to win pan ams if she hadn't done it at world champs so that was quite unexpected um, the men's side's a little more volatile. Like, we probably expected Vadrik or someone like Kiramal to go all the way to the end. At, at least one but, of them. Mm-hmm. But, like, Mateo, they think all are capable of running 4-9 times, if not, like, low 5-0 times. So it's kind of a dice roll. You can expect anyone to win that. But, like, he's... Mateo's, like, definitely the fastest European. So, of course, he would eventually do it, probably, maybe at the European qualifier. And then Sam, of course, you'd expect him maybe to have a get close to doing it at Bern, but then you would expect him to win Pan Am. So the, uh, you'd expect them to do it, but maybe some of them earlier or later than others. I, I, I'm pretty much in line with that same story. And I think what, what I'm really happy with is that for the European qualifier, where there's those couple names that I'm not sure if they're ever going to make it to this round of Olympics, like the veterans who have been you know around forever, didn't make it to 2020 because they're just not good enough and combined, right? So it mm-hmm. is getting to see uh, somebody like Basamawem get back to that Olympic uh, uh, spot when it's in his home country. We'll find out what muscle he decides to explode at this Olympics because uh, the dude is way too old to be speed climbing. But that the EU qualifier was awesome. Uh, if even if you're just watching the men's side, where it was much less predictable from the semifinals, the small final, the big final, were just killer. And seeing Bassa versus Marcin Zensky, two greats of speed climbing, go head to head, and knowing that we would have at least one like really storied superstar veteran go through was really satisfying. Um, so yeah, the EU speed qualifier was was everything I hoped it would be. We got the, like, in my opinion, the right people out of the European speed qualifier. Um, and then for, for NA, I thought pretty much the same thing. The women's side, I don't know the American speed team that well, aside from like Emma Hunt. For the guys, I know the names, but I wouldn't be able to predict. Like, yeah, I think Sam is probably the, the, uh, the exemplary one, but good days, bad days, John, Noah, like, both of them are, are are decorated as well, so I didn't really know, but uh, yeah, yeah. And I guess I'll, I'll give the caveat here that we, I'm sure it's anybody that's watching this. We're probably going to be jumping around a lot, t- talking about not only the different <laughs> disciplines, but probably jumping back and forth in talking about the different uh, events, kind of from Pan Ams to the Euros, back to the Pan Ams. Uh, Albert, can you talk a little bit about Piper Kelly? Because what's really exciting to me about her Olympic birth is I kind of had her pegged as somebody that would be, you know, maybe a potential crusher in the combined back in 2018, 2019, when we were, you know, heading towards the the Tokyo Olympics. Uh, And then she had just, uh, you know, some injuries that took her out of contention for, for a long time. But I think people forget, or maybe people don't even realize, that before Emma Hunt was like this you know, a superstar on the the U.S. 
national team, the U.S. circuit, really the big name, if not like the only big name. I don't want to you know, throw anyone else under the bus, but like the big name was Piper Kelly. And and it's only kind of since Piper ha- has been injured and kind of dropped out of the scene for a while to recover from that injury that Emma Hunt stepped into the spotlight. But Piper's like she's an old school speedster, which is really cool to see her get her due finally. Yeah, so it, I, actually, I wonder if you remember, we were there together when she topped one of the boulders at, at Vale. Do you remember this? What year was this? Ugh. Um, what uh, was the twenty? It was the it was the Natalia year when she was like on her come up. Okay, and we were I'll like, take oh, your, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, take, your, I'll been, take your word for it. It would have been Salt Lake, right? Then. No, no, it was it was Vale. It was definitely Vale. Um, okay. Anyway. But I think it was just John. It was just John that was there. But so initially, like, yeah, she was doing all the combined. And then she had a, a, I think it was a label tear. But she had to step away, finish up college, do life and that. And she came back and she's still doing the old school star, you know, like, and some like the old school betas. And so I, I like sort of like whispered the idea of like hey if you want to switch your beta and like stuff and you want to work on technique and like start looking at speed at a new school way i'm here for you and then we sort of created this relationship together and we've been able to change her beta which was a huge risk like halfway through this world cup season she switched from old school that she's been doing for i don't know over ten thousand runs um into tomoa skip which was huge like uh, i was taking a very big gamble convincing her to do that because like what if i was wrong and it just went crap and she slipped every single run but she didn't and then she had enough points to be uh number two and then in america ranking so she would be first seed into pan ams after emma um so it was kind of her but then you have the third seed sophie curcio sort of coming up as well and so in practice, I think their PR times, um, like Piper is 7-2, and then Sophie has ran like a 7-3-8 or 9. And so they're like within 0.15 of each other, but Piper is like a very, very consistent climber. And so going into it, we're like, oh, it's kind of like our gun versus Ecuadorian's gun, because Andrea's like PR was 0.05 faster than Piper's, maybe 0.04 if I'm correct. So any of them kind of could have won. And it was we were wondering if it was going to be a grand final between Andrea and Piper. But she definitely came around from being like the old school legend, which is hilarious to say that it's old school because speed's such a young sport. You can't even have an old school yet. Um, to being this name again, back, back, like, back on top. Yeah, she's like right there under Emma. So um it's been an interesting story to see her transform herself uh, through her beta and through her storyline that she's been producing how is just for me how old is she i like because she's not a name that if, if you don't make like high world cups i don't pay attention so uh yeah i think she's she turned 24 like a couple of weeks ago oh, okay and, like we right. celebrated her birthday yeah, yeah yeah cool yeah and she held i don't has did Callie Close ever hold the national... Uh, Piper, my point is, Piper held the record before Emma Hunt went on this string yeah. of, like, the breaking US, her own national record. In the, the U.S. US yeah. adult record? Okay. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was, like, 8-1 or something. Yeah, and Albert, can you talk... More? I want to hear more about how you convinced her, or, like, why did she agree now to change her beta when the Tomoa skip has been a, I mean, it's not like she, it's, it's not like it was like a revelation to her. Like she knew what it was right before this. Um, so why, what was it that hooked her now to, to switch things up? Well, so she had only gone sub eight, like maybe three times with her old start. And I was like, Hey Piper, listen, I don't know how much more science I can give you. I don't know how much more I can show you. Every single girl is doing Tomoa Skip for a reason. Except for Emma and Callie, I think. Like, they're all doing it for a reason. I promise it will cut your times down by up to half a second over the long term. You just have to believe me. And, like, I just said, I'm going to tell you that it's better. I'm going to leave it on the table. You can agree or disagree. I do not care. But if you agree and need help, I'm here to help you. And that's how I did it. So I kind of I kind of always approach athletes like that. It's like, hey, this is going to be better. This is the best thing. I'll give you these reasons. 
you don't have to listen to me. I don't care. I got stuff to do. But if you do, I'm going to help you. I'll pour my soul into getting you as best as I can. Um, let's talk about so, uh, yeah. I want to I want to talk about Sam if you don't mind. Um, Sam, somebody that you've been like visibly very close to on social media and stuff like that. And of course, he was probably the one that we were most confident about. But it's still always a risk. He's had some disappointments in races this season. Um, uh, you know, uh, races that he, you know, should have won. Sometimes, sometimes given up. So this was probably a huge relief for him. Um, Tell me about, I, I saw you guys were together last night. Tell me about what you've heard about his experience. Oh, so he told me it was probably one of the coolest experiences of his life being in the village. And even with him, we did a semi-risky beta change before uh, uh, the Chinese World Cup. So before he was skipping a hold towards the top and then we just sat there probably around like 1 a.m. It's like, do I use the hold? Do I bump? instead of skipping right now because it's slightly safer but it is maybe slower we don't know yet we're still like figuring that out and so we did a beta change right before the chinese world cup maybe he had like two weeks to work on it and then we ran it through pan ams because like all right you're just going to be consistent on this and we completely changed his training where it's just all right you have to do 20 runs don't fall that's it like no slips no falls no nothing and then you just have to go to the top every single run um and so we just made sure that he wasn't running his fastest times, but running his most consistent times. So by the time he got there, he said that was like the most, like he, he knew it was, all, it was like all according to plan. Even when he slipped in the grand final a little bit, he was like, oh, it felt fine. I knew exactly where I was. And I just kept on pulling and made it to the top. This this is feedback that I've been seeing from a lot of the athletes after Pan Ams is, is like how many of them uh, felt like a... a, a um, a, uh, I'm terrible with words, but anyway, they a huge positive experience from Canadian American athletes being at the Pan Am Games, being in the village, being among this diverse set of athletes. Um, it's being referred to as like a major games, I guess is is what mm -hmm. this type of event is is called. But I was I was really surprised to see how much of an impact that appeared to have on a lot of these climbers. That it felt like it uh, it. Um, uh, <sighs> God, I need a thesaurus or like a dictionary or something sometimes, but it it justified or or it uh, somebody else take it. Well, it it really it legitimized, like, legitimized the experience. Great, yeah, let's mm -hmm. let's just use that. I was really surprised. It's been like you've been doing these World Cups. You're around climbers all the time. You're around other great athletes, but something about this, something about the I don't I don't know if pageantry is the right word, but it uh, it seemed really important to them, and it seemed like the biggest takeaway from a lot of these climbers. Obviously, only one person can actually get an Olympic spot. So I was really surprised how much uh, how much weight that carried with the athletes here. That was something I was surprised about, and it's kind of changed my perspective on like what about the Olympics makes it important to them? Because there's certainly something about the experience of just being among this community of, of athletes in this kind of setting that means a lot by itself, even without your own performances, uh, which was pretty eye-opening getting to see them talk about that. When I heard them talk about it at the Olympics, I was like, well, this is all just, you know, it's all rose-colored glasses. You got to be the first Olympians ever. Like, of course, you're going to enjoy the whole experience. But seeing it at even something at the level of a Pan Ams, which I have personally experienced in 2015 when Toronto was the host of the Pan Am Games. I was like, oh, this is cool, but it's not, you know, it's not the Olympics or anything like that. Um, so I thought that was interesting to see how they responded to, to the games in general. Probably good for those people that do qualify for the Olympics at the Pan Ams too, right? Because it's like they kind of have that experience of being in the hustle and bustle of the, the vibrant village. You got to think that the people that are at the, the, continental qualifiers maybe like in you know in Oce the oceania um qualification the africa uh, continental i don't know if it's gonna ha quite have the degree of just scale and scope because they're all just climbing specific events right like it's just another comp so yeah and so th that's gonna be anybody that qualifies there the jump from that level that degree of pageantry to the pageantry that you know is going to be at paris for the olympics is huge that's a huge difference Whereas maybe from Santiago, the Pan Am pageantry to Paris, obviously Paris is just much, much bigger, but still it's, a, it's not quite as big of a, big of a gap. Maybe, mm -hmm. um, let's switch gears here, uh, from speed just for a second, at least 
Tyler, <laughs> and you and I are kind of tag teaming on hosting this thing, which I love. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, I asked Albert whether it's been surprising or more what we'd ex- expect, and he took the baton with speed. So I want to phrase it a different way for you, thinking about the combined disciplines, the, the combined discipline that we've seen so far in Europe and at the Pan Ams, and even at Worlds, if you want to loop that in too. What has been, in your opinion, the biggest combined surprise result who that's a uh, that is a good one i think i think my biggest one even though somebody like jesse pills might be an answer i think my biggest one is jesse grouper not because he was necessarily like a giant surprise from the pan am event specifically but because i think uh, he just wouldn't have been on my radar as like a top 10 combined climber if I just took the entire international scene all together, right? Um, I think of him as, as a strong lead climber, but not really a factor in bouldering. So I probably would have put him as like, you know, what if he goes through, it's at the OQS. But it's so fascinating when you when you narrow it down to just a specific continent like the Americas, you look at the field and you're like, holy shit, he's actually like the favorite among this group of people, right? Like Sean Bailey is a talented climber at both. Obviously, he's got gold medal in, in both bouldering and lead, but that's from a couple years ago. And, and you know, whether or not that adds up to being better than Jesse Grouper, uh, it turns out turns out it wasn't enough. Um, so while I might have said Sean Bailey's a stronger combined climber, that's not how it went uh, down in Santiago. And Jesse Grouper capped off that event with like a gorgeous lead climb, getting to demonstrate his, his real strengths and, and just have an awesome cap to that event. So I'd probably put him so far as, as uh, of all of the combined athletes that are qualified so far, I think he's the biggest outlier is what I would say. Do you agree, Albert? Yeah, I, I like how interesting that the continental events have become because it puts climbers in a vacuum. In- interesting like, is one word it. for it, but yeah. Yeah, it also, yeah. But yeah, putting climbers in a vacuum shows that like, yeah, so maybe Jesse will never see the light and day of a bouldering semifinals World Cup. But like when you put him against like the field narrows, then it's like, oh, he's like probably the fourth Mate, like best boulder in the field or something like that. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's enough to get you far if you have a yes. good lead round. So, yeah. yeah, the Olympics will also probably show something like that where it's like, okay, we're in a vacuum now. We have narrowed the field. Where do you really stack up? And then we can see some people that you don't expect go way further. I think that Jesse did in a lot of ways have kind of the climb of his life, the performance of his life at, at Pan Ams. I, I, I am going to be r- really curious and really interested to see what type of gains Jesse, we're talking about Jesse Grouper here, Jesse can make this coming year leading up to the Olympics in bouldering specifically because when you look at his World Cup results I think he had a 27th place at Innsbruck bouldering in 2022 but uh, usually his boulder results in the the World Cups that he's done is like somewhere in the 30s somewhere in the 40s, maybe in the 50s. Uh, I think he was 51st at the World Championships in bouldering. And if you look at some of the other qualified Olympians so far, Colin Duffy, most notably, he's had World Cup success in bouldering and in lead. Jakob Schubert, World Cup success in bouldering and in lead. Jesse Grouper has certainly had World Cup success in lead. I think you'd be hard-pressed to say he's had a lot of World Cup success, relatively speaking, obviously, in the boulder discipline. And so I would think if I'm looking at what he is hoping, how he is hoping to progress in his Olympic training, I would think a big focus on bouldering, improvements in bouldering would be that i think that would be like the big spotlight in this year leading up to paris do you think do, am i way off base there tyler or do you think i mean like go ahead i cannot Albert. deny that when you look at jesse and then you look at colin duffy and you look at jacob schubert and you look at tomoa too who's a, the bold like a bouldering specialist you're like jesse's kind of the outlier because he's the lead specialist right yeah like i think the one thing that people forget is that Jesse kind of knows exactly what he needs to work on, right? And so, man, I think maybe the session before he left for Pan Ams, I saw him do an up-down-up. So that means you're climbing continuously. You're not coming on the ground. He went, like, up a V11, 
down a V7, up a V10. And I was like blown away because what, I what tried those this? times. Just so we can get some context on what a V11 is. What's the, what's the gym? Mo- Momentum Mill Creek. So right. momentum. <laughs> Anybody in the chat, let me know how hard. sandbagged the the V eleven set momentum milk creek are, please. But yeah, okay. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, like, I don't trust people... gym double digits, man. I just don't trust yeah. gym double digits. <laughs> no, you can't touch these climbs. Like these are messed okay. up climbs. All right. Um, and so he he clearly knows. Oh, I in a in a in a bubble in a vacuum, I am not going to be the most lead boulder favorite. But he's like doing his damnedest, his hard work to make sure he can like go toe to toe or like keep up enough to where he can make up and lead. So his strategy has been working. I think my, my, not my concern, but like, I, I do wonder if it almost makes more sense for him just to be in extraordinary lead shape, because I don't know, like, I think training for bouldering is a lot harder than training for lead. If he's already a lead specialist and it feels like it's kind of a coin flip of whether or not the boulder round actually has any, major effect on the scores which is the crazy thing like in in the final round that jesse competed in he was behind by like what maybe 15 points from the leader after bouldering and then of course he what was he like 30 or 40 points ahead of everybody just from his lead climb like his lead climb was above and beyond there was tremendous room for him to separate and lead but we're seeing in the other competitions and other rounds uh we're seeing comps where like the bouldering has almost no effect on on the uh, um, on the actual scores, it all comes down to lead placement, and so part of me is like, you know what, just keep your lead form up, and you know, do a little bit of bouldering and stuff. But I don't know how much more you can improve to try and put yourself on the level of a Jakob Schubert or possibly or like Tomoa or people like that. Like, are you really going to catch up with that shit if those boulders show up? Are you going to make any progress past the like first dynamic, like triple paddle, like whatever? Like, those are hard skills to learn, hard skills to master. The strength, the power, those are the hardest things to train for and actually build. Fortunately, he's got a long runway to do it, so maybe it's possible. But part of me is like, hey, man, if you just keep your lead climbing on par, you're going to dummy Tomoa on a lead wall. So just try to perfect that and get squeeze as many points out of the lead as possible. I don't know. Do either of you have an opinion on like the format of bouldering, like the multiple zones? Do you think that's in favor or against lead climbers, like not in favor? I don't know if... I. I don't know about the zones in particular. I, I've said before that it's weird to me to make a, a perfect score in Boulder 100 points and a perfect score in lead 100 points. Like if you want to do the 200 points uh, combined f- total score, it's weird to me to have four flashes on boulders equate to four tops. Or, or I'm sorry, four flashes of, of four boulders to equate to topping a lead route. Because if you and I, I think it was on a previous episode that we like looked at all the stats of the past World Cups and whatnot. But it's not the statistics are not equal that like how compared to how often somebody flashes all four boulders to how often somebody uh, fla- uh, tops a lead route. It's it's way rarer, if I recall, that someone flashes all four boulders in a in a round. And so to have them equal the same amount four flashes and a top of the lead route that just seems kind of strange to me because they're not uh statistically performatively equal but i i don't know i haven't given much thought to the to the different zones yeah i'm i'm pretty uh passive when it comes to this format because combined there's like so much give and take and it's like you know what it's it's so hard to balance these two disciplines out i think the the one change I, i would like to make is like i would like maybe to give the root setters the freedom to us. So if you have two zones and a top, I'd like them to maybe be able to adjust how much those two zones are worth. So instead of the first zone always being worth five points, maybe if it's what they think is the crux move, maybe the first move is worth 15, the second zone is 20, and the last one is 25. Um, Just here and there, you get people that that manage to get that first zone and they only get five points for it, but it was by far the hardest part of the boulder. Kind of wish you would actually get some reward to reflect that it was like, you know, the hardest move. It kind of seems silly. You only get five points for that. Um, but ultimately, I'm like, I, I I really don't believe that combined is even a real discipline in the first place. So I don't actually care. Ultimately, it's a fun exercise. But like, I'm not, you know, I whoever wins the Olympics, it doesn't actually mean that much to me in terms of like how good of a climber I think you are. 
Tyler, can I give my hot take again? That you know that I, I don't know if I've said uh, on air, but if hey man, you're putting you're putting your you're putting yourself on the line. You can say whatever you want. Okay, Albert, um, agree or disagree? Okay, I'm ready. I, I as I've been watching the two discipline. So uh, let's back up as as we should. Anybody that's just tuning in that might be new to watching this level of competition climbing, the the Olympics in 2020 slash 2021 featured a three discipline combined format, speed, boulder, and lead. And then the upcoming Olympics in Paris will only pe- feature boulder and lead as the combined. So you have two events combined instead of three. And as I've been watching the Pan Ams and the European qualification, I'm kind of getting nostalgic for the three <laughs> discipline combined format. And my thinking is, and I know you'll probably love it cause you're a speed guy, but my thinking is look, it's not going to be a perfect system no matter what when you combine <laughs> multiple disciplines. So if we're going to make it funky, if we're going to make it weird, why not go all the way? You don't want to do anything like part way. So if you're going to make it just all wonky, combine all three rather than just two. That's kind of my my hot take, I guess. I like, like how you make it sound like it, it was a good thing for speed climbers. It's like, yeah, you'll like this because of speed climb. It was a war crime against speed climbers, man. That, that, <laughs> like, what, what are you talking about? I'm just saying two female speed athletes made Olympic finals. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yes, that was almost mathematically guaranteed based on the format. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then yeah. what happened? Like, then what happened? And, and, and did they get, they get dunkstered? It's okay, but, you know, they made finals. They made finals. <laughs> yeah, I uh, my hot take is maybe the three-discipline combined was better than the two-discipline combined. I don't know. People in the comments can uh, – and I don't know if I fully agree with that. It's just kind of something that pops into my head every now and then. Um, let me ask – it's interesting talking about Jesse Grouper because I do think there are parallels to – his performance at Pan Am's and Toby Roberts performance at the European qualifications, particularly, I think they had the same two out of four boulders topped if I recall. Right. And then both crushed the lead routes. Um, I don't think Jesse didn't top the lead route, but he, he came close, but, but before we move on to, to maybe European, I want to talk about the women's portion of the combined at the Pan Am's, uh, because I think this was so after Yanya qualified at Bern at the World Championships, she wrote on Instagram that this was like the right Yanya, right? That was like the phrase we she used. I come away from Pan Ams and I said, this was whatever you want to say, the right Natalia or the old Natalia, or maybe you could say it's a new Natalia. This was the best version of Natalia that I think we have seen. Maybe all season or certainly, you know, it's been it's been a couple comps since we've seen her climb in a way that just seemed so fluid, so confident, so poised and calm. Uh, I wrote that she just to recap real fast. She was only one uh, only two of the women finalists topped the first boulder. It was Natalia and Alana. Everyone topped boulder two. Only two people topped boulder three, which was the slab. That was Brooke and Natalia. And then uh, boulder four was the dud with no tops. But then in the lead portion, Natalia got really high on high up onto the head wall. And I just feel like this was um, this was kind of like the Natalia that I think we saw this season periodically. But I think last season we expected to see maybe the whole time this season. And that wasn't the case. Um, and I will say, Tyler, you know, what do I love more than anything uh, when talking about rivalries? It's a, it's the good, it's the, it's the Natalia versus Yanya rivalry that's been going on both, for the past. Both equal athletes who should be. Well, it's been going on in the, it's been going on for the past three years. <laughs> yeah. They both had their ups and downs. Uh, but it has been fascinating nonetheless throughout the whole process. And here we finally, I think it's like, yeah, maybe we'll see prime Natalia and prime Yanya at Paris 2024. Who knows? That's a long way off. But if Pan Ams and if Worlds in Bern were any indication, then both of those athletes, and Natalia in particular right now, since we're talking about her, 
is in a really good headspace, really good place. Back at it, I guess. Yeah, I think I would just summarize as like this this season introduced a new uh, like character arc for Natalia or like a new aspect of herself as a climber, which was uh, this struggle that she had with with health issues that had a really big impact on how she performed. And so where she was previously uh, unwaveringly consistent at being the best climber aside from Yanya Garmbret, this season we had to reevaluate that. And uh, because of the inconsistency, we started to put or I started to put Brooke Rabatou as somebody that was on par or possibly better, at least more consistent than Natalia. And so every time Natalia now has a win, has a good day, we're kind of getting reacquainted with what we should expect from her as a climber. And it, it makes it a little bit more interesting. It makes it a little harder to know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, I, Brooke was narrowly my pick uh, to take this title at the Pan Ams just because she's had a more consistent season. Um, but it was excellent to see Natalia climbing on her best day. How, how depressing would it be to see Natalia, who... Um, who broke out in 2021 before the 2021 Olympics, but couldn't be there, right? Like she broke out too late to to attend the the Tokyo Olympics, but soon enough that she was the name on every on the tip of everybody's tongue, and she wasn't even at the the event, right? So I want her to be there. She's she's been a really important name for the last uh, three years in comp climbing, and uh, I'm glad she got it. I think Brooke is a shoe in for one of the OQS spots, so I'm not too I'm not too sad. I'm not too bitter, um, but. Uh, yeah, I, I loved it. It was great seeing her climb well. Albert, what did you think of Natalia's performance, particularly looking at sort of the lineage of this of her performances this past 2023 season? I think if you were watching the live stream, the best thing you could see is Natalia was smiling way more during the boulder round than like the whole season probably. Um, after Burn World Championship, I saw her at Bouldering Project and I was like, oh yeah, like, you know, what's next? What's your, what are you planning on? And she said her new approach for training for Pan Ams was just to have more fun. And I, and I got to see that, like, firsthand. Like, she would just go in and just moonboard or kilter board for herself, like, be reading a book or whatever. It was, like, there wasn't very, like, a strict structure, strict uh, training as I've seen other people. Like, okay, I have to do 40 doubles right now or else I'm not going to ever be a climber for the rest of my life. And so I was very impressed. I think it was, like, a mindset shift. Like, her skills have already been there. And she just showed that when you have confidence and it, it, it translates to the wall in your performance as well. She posted something on Instagram saying that she was in a car accident two days prior to the event in Santiago, which I'm really curious to know more about. It sounds like it was a pretty, I think she called it like a near death experience, which makes me, I, I want to know more details about what, what all this entailed and where it took place and the circumstances, because I think that that is now part of her, story her larger olympic story in a way um i think there are still oh and she also mentioned that she changed a lot in her i think her phrase was something like in my training and in my life or something and th so that raises my my sort of curiosity as well like what you know that's it, it's one thing to, ch to change your training it's another thing to change various aspects of your life i'd like to know what that means uh but i think we are still right to wonder what version of natalia quote unquote shows up at paris right because we saw at the world championships that she i mean she's human of course she can get rattled by these big events i think it was easy to forget because she rocked the previous world championships uh she did so well there and won the boulder championship there a couple years ago we kind of thought that she would just roll through these world championships as well seems like the pressure or whatever who knows what was going on but something maybe got to her um I, I just want to mention like this is a story that we've seen from a lot of athletes in the last six months and it is hot climbers confronting high pressure failure for the first time and it being a very needed reset for them to come back down to earth and take a different angle and not take the dumb stuff too serious we saw it with alexandra miraslaw uh we've seen it I, honestly with toby as well after his world championship performance um we're seeing it with natalia handling her health we've seen it with yanya over the last couple of years as she's dealt with uh, uh well coming down from the olympic highs but then also uh the broken foot and and all that kind of stuff just appreciating winning so i think that's something we're seeing because there's so many fresh names on this uh like on this current like 
uh, uh, circuit of climbers, a lot of them are experiencing these moments for the first time, right? Like Natalia had a great 2021 world championship, but that world championship was like the the weakest world championship in history, basically. And there was really nothing to fight for aside from a world championship title that the best climbers in the world didn't show up for. This burn was huge, man. It had consequences and it's where everybody felt like they were supposed to have their big impact. And I think it 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 woke a lot of people up. And so it's really refreshing seeing all these climbers sharing the same kind of story of like, oh yeah, I had to, I had to just like give myself some credit, give myself some space, give like, you know, and 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 just remind myself that I'm just a person and I love climbing and I need to enjoy this and I need to back off a little bit from from putting unnecessary pressure on on myself so it's it, it is cool seeing that like healthy development in a lot of these young athletes that's they're a good all, dovetail. They're growing up so fast. <laughs> they're growing up so fast. Yeah. That, that's a good dovetail, Tyler, into talking about the European qualification event because one of the things as I was watching the combined there is I actually wrote it in my notes. I said Hannah Moyle's final round on in on the boulders reminds me a lot of Natalia at Worlds. Mm. Um, just the demeanor, just like nothing seemed to be clicking. And I think Later on Instagram, Hannah revealed that I think the circumstances were very different from Natalia. Apparently, Hannah was she's been sick. I think she said she had the flu or something like that. So it might have been more physical rather than psychological, or maybe it was a combination of both. But I think I would put H Hannah Moyle on that list as well, who a couple years ago, we kind of thought, OK, she's going to be the next big thing in Boulder. It's going to be like Yanya and mm -hmm. Natalia and Hannah Moyle, right? Like that was kind of, we were kind of expecting that to be the trifecta of the future. And then Hannah had a, a, a bit of a, a season with like lesser results than we would have expected. And it kind of all comes to like a sort of a culmination, at least for now, at these European qualification events, the event where she, you know, I, I think she got a, a top on the, I don't remember if she topped the first, first boulder, but she didn't top this, uh, or she, she got, no top top. On, she got yeah, one top. She got one top. Yeah, she got one top on the third boulder. Thank you. And um, as I was watching, I, I remember thinking like, wow, I wouldn't have expected Lucia Dorfel, who is a great climber, but I wouldn't have expected her to do demonstrably better than Hannah Moyle in, at this, in these finals, but she did. And so I think Hannah's another one who kind of now has to reassess. And, and, and let's pan out a little bit. Ger the team, the German team too, is suddenly like – one of those national teams that you're kind of like, wow, they don't have anybody qualified yet. Um, <laughs> which is kind of a little bit of a little bit surprising considering how they've sort of been on a rise for the past couple seasons. Oh, just cause you brought up Hannah Moyle. I'll just put, she's, she's kind of, in my opinion, in the opposite camp. I think, uh, you know, Alexandra, Toby, uh, Natalia, those names that we just talked about, they've already proven to themselves that they can do big things and their pressure is coming from the expectation. Whereas Hannah has not proven to herself that she can win a world cup yet. And she feels so close and she's been, so close so many times and she feels like this is supposed to be my time but look at look at the crowd you're climbing against man like we're actually in a really good era of of female bouldering and lead climbing um and so she's got the opposite she doesn't have that medal she doesn't or she doesn't have a gold medal specifically um so i think she's dealing with something else where she is just trying to find some validation for her success and it couldn't be coming at a worse time when there is a lot of pressure and she's the one that Germany is trying to hold up as their best chance but she still probably hasn't internalized it herself that she's able to win these things because she hasn't felt that before um yeah a, a brutal set of pressure for sure um yeah talk, talking about the the European competition um I I kind of want to so Toby Roberts obviously is the story from that competition if only because his top was just such a great finish like what a what a way to finish that entire comp like a, a fancy move at the top and just making it look easy it was excellent uh and again one of those young young guys that two years ago literally two years ago his name would not be on the list of contenders for 2024 if we had to make our best guesses um but if if you don't mind me swerving again is talking about the people who 
didn't come in first place. Um, we've seen lots of Instagram posts. Uh, there's always post-mortems after competitions. Uh, climbers like Sean Bailey had a, a widely shared um, kind of him coming to terms with how he feels about his performance. And for him, he is locked out, right? The USA has claimed their two spaces for the Boulder and Lead combined, so Sean Bailey does not have a chance to get in. Um, but also uh, somebody like Noah Bracci kind of uh, confronting what this means for him. Stasi Gejo has had a recently discussed, posted and then deleted uh, uh, kind of comment on, on why she didn't perform well or why she thought other people may have been the reason she didn't perform well. Um, how do you guys feel about the people um, basically, you know, confronting loss when for these continental events, it never was going to matter if you came second place. Like I, that's, I think the thing that surprises me is, is that there are some folks, particularly uh, the ones that aren't yet locked out. They still have a chance at the OQS. I'm kind of surprised how, how shaken up some people are by coming second in a comp where like the podium doesn't matter. You have to come first. And I don't think any of these people were, were locks for first place. Like if you go in as like the second or third best American speed climber and only one of you can go through, like what's, what expectations should you really have from these competitions? I don't know if you guys have any, any thoughts on this. Like, what is it really a disappointment if you come second or third in a comp where you were supposed to come second or third in? I don't know. It's, it seems like people are, are really emotional about stuff that I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what was supposed to happen. What's, what's the confusion? So out of all the posts of the second place or even third place finishers from these qualifiers, uh, actually the only person I think who is like, kind of psyched is maybe Noah Bracci. Yeah. <laughs> like, he, Cause like that was his best performance ever, like his fastest times in comp. Right. And we even had a long, almost two hour phone call literally right after the comp. And now he's like, oh, this is actually, I'm like, I'm unlocked. I feel like I can win OQS series or like do well there. But like when you look at even Alberto Hinas Lopez's post, it's like, dude, it like hit people hard. They yeah. just going through you have to go through a second another season. They don't have rest. They have to start training now for OQS, basically. Mm -hmm. And so it's brutal. They've never they're not gonna get a rest until like next year, August. So, it, I guess I guess we're just I like it. It, it it's funny for me because Alberto, I don't think should have considered himself a favorite like even a top three favorite to win this event but because he was in first place for maybe like a total of five minutes all of a sudden it feels like a disappointment right i just i to me as an outsider who's never ever competed in anything with this kind of high pressure i'm obviously the worst person to talk about it but here i am anyways um I, I just find that it it seems like uh, uh, incongruent with how i thought people would be cons like thinking about these events i don't know I, yeah, it's really hard for us as the people that aren't, it, we're not that at that elite level. I mean, Albert, you you've competed for spots on the national team and stuff, so you have a, a little, you know, you're you're more experienced to this than Tyler or I am. I I think, I do think though. I mean, I mean, I'm just kind of like guessing here and riffing, but I think that when I think that at some point when you're training for a big goal like this, expectation has to become like belief, right? I like to train your best. It doesn't matter if you're 15th in the world or 30th or 50th or 100th in the world. To train your best, you have to believe that the Olympics, the Olympic qualification is possible. And so I I think at some point probably even maybe subconsciously there's a switch. And even if you'd look at it objectively and say, "Yeah, I'm I'm not statistically or rank-wise the best in the world." I think you still go into it like thinking I'm going to do this and I'm going to shock the world and I'm going to get that Olympic place. And I think that when that doesn't happen, it doesn't matter how you're ranked. It doesn't matter if you weren't expected to do it. Like in your moment, when you lined up on those boulders or that lead wall or that speed wall, you thought you could do it. And I think that that's the sort of soul crushing thing, right? Like it, Tyler, to your point, it doesn't, you don't have to be, it, it, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not measured by where you are ranked throughout the season. It's measured by that those four minutes that you were on that boulder that you thought you had a chance. Like, that's what makes it so soul-crushing, I guess. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's almost hard to read some of these posts, right? Like, Sean Bailey, you read his and you're just like, man, I really, I feel for you. And I actually... 
um, it's it, you're like, gosh, what do you even say to this, right? Uh, what do you even yeah. say to a guy like this? Um, because you you want to say to him like, hey man, like no, like we feel for you, your performance like was awesome and your your efforts really matter. But then like his whole post is like kind of saying like, yeah, people keep telling me it matters, but like. I don't know if it, and you're like, ah, oh, then you're just kind of adding on to the pile. Then if you just say something like that, so I don't know. I, I realize think- it is it is a little bit ridiculous for me to me to like suggest to athletes like, yeah, you know, you weren't supposed to win, so why did you even bother like being sad? Okay, I realize <laughs> I'm kind of the idiot actually. Like, yeah, I should try and tell Sean Baylor like, well, no, you know, based on your past performance, this is what we would have expected. So why are you sad? Is kind of dumb. So I I retract my statement, John. You you brought me back to earth on that one. Well, I think the point is you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe that you are capable. Yeah, you're totally right. You're you totally would right. we would not be, this sport would not be nearly as exciting if every competitor went into it thinking like well i'm like third best in the world so i'm probably not going to win this so like you know those are the breaks like i i I I take it all back i take it all back yeah that's true i (laughs) Uh, yeah i i I don't know uh back to sean i just uh he said as he pointed out on instagram that's two olympics in a row where he has come in like just you know missing that on the cusp right missing that one that Mm -hmm. spot by one place and uh, man and and you and you go back to Tyler something that you and I said during the Tokyo Olympics which was like yeah it's great for people like Jan Hoyer and Sean McCall and all these other veterans that were grinding away on the circuit before it had an Olympic spotlight before a lot of these people that are into it now cared about it these people were like sacrificing a lot to be on the World Cup circuit so the fact that Jan and Sean and all these other and and Akio they got their moment in the Olympics that felt like some sort of ju- like that was it felt like some reward in a way. And you're like, man, Sean deserves that, too, as much as anybody deserves this. Right. Like, that's the problem. Nobody deserves it. You have to earn it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just felt like Sean's in that group, too, where you're like, man, this guy was grinding on the circuit for so long before it was an Olympic thing. It just would have been really nice if he got to live that Olympic moment once and he doesn't. And that just breaks your heart. It's really sad. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. Um, listen, we got to wrap up soon, so I wanna I wanna just throw to either of you if if you have anything in particular you want to say. Like Albert, we don't get to have you on very often, so I don't know if there's any stories you wanted to share or anything. John, if there's any if there's any like points you wanted to bring up, my quick shout out was to Sean McCall for climbing through that lead route with apparently a broken rib. That's hilarious. Guy knows his body, and he uh, he did a good job. So so uh, proud of you, man. I know he made a good choice for him. I know he understands like what the consequences are and he also definitely wouldn't have pushed himself any further than he should have uh so cool cool story anyways um yeah it's all the old guys him and bassa they're all damaged man they gotta watch out uh, yeah i say, think yeah please oh, sorry uh just the results have been like really exciting um there are just some weird incongruencies where like yeah uh we'll always question what would have changed if emma hadn't competed at pan ams mm-hmm. um we also will never know what who would have won if Martian and Leander Carmen didn't tie, <laughs> and like because yeah. his second yeah. win race would have yes. beat Boss's time. So we'll yeah. never know there. Yeah. And there's always like these like random stories. Is like okay, what if Adamandra didn't apparently pick feet every move in campus like the oh. whole route? Like would he have won? I, we don't know. And so it's like always interesting that that's like sort of the beauty of climbing and competition climbing. Mm-hmm. It's like you'll never know, but it's whoever showed up on the day made us know what was possible. Yeah. Yeah. I, Adam Andra seemed surprisingly like, I don't know, in good spirits, considering at least like um, for a lot of that, um, unless I missed something, I turned it off to, to start writing. Do, do you guys, uh, can you confirm that, that he seemed like for, for sort of a, a uh, surprising slip there. I thought that, like, I mean, in the moment, he was like, you know, yeah, but like, I think, it didn't seem like the heartbreak that you thought it might be. I, I just think the one thing that's so different from last time around is, like, the cushion of the OQS is is such a relief for these guys where like, yeah, so you, so you didn't quite do well enough at the world champs. You didn't quite do well enough at the continental choir fire. Guess what, Adam, you just got to be top 10 buddy. And it's probably going to be top 11, possibly top 12. Right. Um, he's going to be fine. And I, he knows that obviously. So I think, uh, especially cause we saw some people didn't show up to, uh, to this event cause it just makes more sense to save it for the OQS. Um, yeah, I think he's going to do just fine. So I think he was, he was all right with, uh, with this particular performance. 
We did not talk really at all about Orion's performance. We're sort of out of time here, but uh, that was uh, just, like we said, that was the best version of Natalia. I think you could argue the same thing for, for Orion. It just really seems like... I, these Olympics, everything is lining up to be sort of perfect for Orion, right? In in the sense of she's been on the circuit for a couple years, so she has the experience. She's not she's not the rookie. Mm-hmm. She, the Olympics are going to be in her home country, which could go either way. That could be good or bad, but we'll say it's on the surface. It seems like you would think that that's a positive. Right, it makes them want it more for sure. Yeah, and she is. Like other than Yanya, maybe other than Natalia and Brooke, uh, I, I think the continents probably it depends on the continent. But Orion's like the biggest name on the comp circuit in the women's division. Yep. So her, um, she's got a, a lot of fans. So there's a lot of momentum behind Orion right now heading into these Olympics. And she seems to be taking it all in stride. Doesn't seem to be getting to her at all. She seems kind of cruising right now. So um, very interesting to see an Olympics with prime... Yanya, prime Natalia, prime Orion. Yeah, it's already shaping up to be really exciting. Yeah, and on the flip side, Mejdi is not doing what we thought he uh, he would have done. Also, somebody that's probably going to be fine in the OQS, but uh, yeah, it's not not panning out as easy as he thought it would based on his early performances this season. So maybe we thought it would have been done sooner, but uh, yeah, he's going to have to fight all year. Cool, uh, Albert. Let me give you the closing word if you want to if you want to say one last thing or if you want to shout out to somebody if you want to advertise your free coaching or something. It's totally totally up to you, buddy. <laughs> I have just bought one thing. It's backwards. Sam Watson climbing. Oh, <laughs> it's just a wristband that says Sam Watson climbing. Um, I wish the best of luck to everyone at the OKS series. And also, Asia Continental will be crazy for both sides. Two, two and... weeks from now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, like about two weeks, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then we'll see. We'll see. May the best athlete win. It'll be amazing. Team USA. <laughs> yeah absolutely john, john if you don't mind i'll just close it just to to wrap it up real quick but yeah thank you very much for watching we'll probably do one more of these this year after uh the asian oceana and what's the other continent Af- hey, africa. africa africa completely inconsequential continent when it comes to climbing unfortunately but when all of those are wrapped we'll do another short one of these just to to clean it up before the year ends uh but otherwise thanks again for watching hop in the discord to watch the asian uh, continentals with us we had a blast for the last two so so join in there otherwise we'll see you guys in the next one